Greetings, welcome to my patio review of sorts. Today, for Short Buyer Guys Invitation, I will review this Shikoho Hidden Samurai Katana. Disclaimer first, it was sent to me by Sword Buyer Guys and um, Buck K for free uh, as a review sample. I'm very grateful, but I will remain unbiased as I'm a very uh, picky person, and I will point out all the flaws as well as all the highlights who this sword is potentially for and how to improve uh, from a maker's perspective. We'll head out for a test cutting session, put the sword to its paces and find out what it's capable of. Now disclaimer, I don't practice Japanese martial arts and I rarely cut with katanas. 
I'm used to the European way to do a passing step for each cut, so the static way of Tamishigiri feels alien to me. That said, I just injured my ankle and I still can't pivot that foot very well, so perhaps the static lower body in the Japanese way of cutting is a temporary boom. As a comparison, this Shikoto Katana is capable of cutting as well as the infamous Hanwei Practical SL when the edges are aligned. But you need to take care of that yourself, meaning the sword will not self-correct, and it's not forgiving to bad cuts. Furthermore, the blade doesn't carry a lot of authority, so it doesn't do any work for you. The user is expected to generate enough tip speed himself. All that is a feature, not a bug. If you consider the vast differences in blade profile and the edge geometry between this sword and the very cutting-oriented katana, whose primary purpose is an easy time with Tamishiguri. The Shikoto katana serves a different purpose which we'll soon find out by taking a look at the entire package and the details. So this sword is shipped from Georgia and arrived in Canada in 10 days. It is a uh, wooden sword box, which usually has a nice open. So this one here, you can see, it's not properly padded. So when it arrived, uh, the sword was banging inside the box and I thought, well, this is a bad sign. And um, luckily, it wasn't too badly damaged. So these uh, the bits that that's supposed to uh, hold the sword in place failed. Well, it's sturdy to me. It's banging against uh, these loose parts inside the box. You can see that on Saya, there are some minor thing or uh, dents, scuff marks on the Saya uh, during the transportation. Thing over here. Nothing major. First advice to Buck Kate. Properly package and patch your swords inside a wooden case so they wouldn't be shipped in a state of disarray to anger your customers. When I was informed that uh, I received this new sample, I look up this product in Shikoto. Uh, seem to be a brand that sells swords crafted by uh, Smiths that don't have their uh, venture business. So I'm not sure whether uh, swords uh, in this entire line are crafted by a single smith, but the description of the marketing material uh, did make me cringe a little bit. Uh, crafted by a hermit master living in the Longchuan mountain? <laughs> really? Uh, also, uh, when you hold on to the sword, you feel as if you're holding on to the same sword <laughs> uh, crafted by masters. 2,500 years ago. Not sure whether this grossly exaggerated anime and tactical ninja vibe uh, will turn potentially customers off on the certificate that came with a sword. Uh, you can see the description is grounded to reality, which is nice. It gives a brief intro to the place of manufacturing, as well as some basic information and statistics about the sword. One word is featured heavily, Longquan, so why the emphasis? Longquan is this bustling town in China that has a tradition of being the sword forging center going back 2,500 years. It came into prominence when the grandmaster swordsmith Ouye, Master Ouye, settled in during his last 10 years of life to forge the five swords commissioned by kings of various states. After his death, his last five swords were so highly sought after by monarchs so much so that major diplomatic incidents were caused and wars were declared over the ownership of his swords. Longquan literally means dragon spring or dragon brooks, were named after the local creek he redirected to facilitate easy crunching for sword forging in his advanced age. The way he rearranged the creek made it look like a serpentine dragon when one looks from above in the mountains. Swordsmiths congregate in this town in the last two and a half millennia, and today there are hundreds of registered forges and workshops in this county level city. The place it holds in China is equivalent to Zolian and Passau in Germany and Seki in Japan. People claim that Longquan, which is situated uh, in the mountainous region, 
has this water containing various uh, elements that can be introduced during the crunching into the blade steel. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is true in the past, but today with the modern forging techniques and modern steels, what remains is the sword making traditions left in Longchen. The smiths that made this sword operates out of Longchen too, and the marketing material makes a big deal out of it. The certificate of authenticity shows the smith's signature, so I looked up this guy's credential. Turns out he's legit with more than 20 years of experience and does hold the artisan certificate, though not a master title. Uh, some of his past works are being sold at other smiths business ventures. You can see here, one katana with laminated steel blade is priced at $2,000. So this smith is no stranger to higher end projects. Though this katana forged for Shikoto definitely targets the entry level market. Two pervading impressions when I first pick up the sword. First is how suspiciously light the sword is, which turned out to be from the lightness of the saya or scabbard. And the second one is how tightly the sword fits in the scabbard. The saya is of the most minimalist design with black lacquer painted over the core, which even though feels kind of flimsy, turns out to be actually made of wood. It doesn't have any fancy feature like rattan wrapping or stonewashed finish or any decorative patterns, just completely unadorned glossy black. Upon closer inspection, there is a koiguchi or scabbard mouth made of what seems to be buffalo horn, and the kurigata uh, seem to be integrated, so there's no worry that it will fall out. The two pieces of brass shitadome are glued on and seem secure too. The kurigata knot here is um, not tight in a very tight way. Uh, it's a little loose here, um, shifting back and forth. The shape of the tabaki makes sure the, the sword stays stuck inside the saya. But it's relatively smooth stroll um, in a sheathing motion. Um, so that's important for a sword like katana. It has this um, feel of a little adorned utilitarian appeal. It still has some color palette that's, uh, that's very unusual. The light brown cores and the ito wrapping uh, has a clear contrast with a black and bronze fitting. Overall, it has this um, very simplistic feel uh, that almost akin to clay, and um, I suppose it's uh, very uh, suitable for its uh, hidden samurai scene, which is a hired assassin, almost like a golem made out of clay, so you have no identity. It's just a professional serving as master or employer. So Japanese swords are not my primary interest, but over the years I have collected several katanas of different specifications prior to acquiring this review sample. And you can see they are of different styles. Uh, from the uh, ceremonial tachi uh, with bronze fitting, very decadently decorated with the tamahagane, the jade steel, traditionally forged blade, and um, katana decorated with um, elaborate fuchi, kashira, and tuba uh, with a T10 tool steel blade to the good old Hanwei practical XL katana uh, with the bohi a supremely good cutter to a very uh, budget friendly Shirasaya katana so we're gonna review this sword um, in the context of comparing them to the ones I have and this Shikoto katana here uh, if you take a look it features relatively short blade 28 and a half inch blade um, almost the shortest I have owned um, minus the habaki here is um, 27 and a quarter inch blade forged from T10 to steel uh, T10 is the uh, designation of uh, Chinese high carbon steel 
uh, it contains exactly 1% of carbon content, so that's very high. Um, uh, 1095 contains 0.95% uh, uh, dash lower carbon content than this one, and that one, the 1095 is already considered very high in carb carbon content. This T10 here is often uh, referred to as high speed to steel by the Chinese to remain hard uh, even in high temperature. Um, some call this as tungsten steel, but in fact only contains a dash of tungsten, usually less than 0.3%. On the certificate here, you can see that the edge uh, has been hardened to 62 uh, Rockwell scale C, so that's indeed very hard, probably ideal for katana, because traditionally made katanas are differentially hardened. What this means is that the blade is covered in a layer of clay of different thickness before crunching. So the edge and the spine, or the ha and the mune, are cooled down at different rates during the crunching. The end result is the edge can be very hard with the spine being soft. So the entirety of the blade can remain rigid, yet not overall brittle, so it won't break in half but would rather bend under stress. This Shikoto Katana here was indeed clay tempered, so the blade features a natural hamon line as the artifact of that differentially hardening process. The polisher took the pain to bring out that hamon line in a way that's natural and subtle. Uh, you can easily make it out under the right lighting. However, if you scope down the blade, you can see numerous little ripplings on both surfaces. If I press my finger on the blade and run it down, uh, whether it's on the bulky, the fuller, or on the blade surface, um, I can detect some very uh, noticeable rippling. You might consider this as an artifact of the hammer forging process, but the troubling fact is that I can't feel the same degree of rippling on the blade surfaces on any of these three katanas which brings the skill and the experience of the polisher into question. Given that most of the time, the smith forging the blade is a different person from the one polishing the blade. This could mean that an inexperienced polisher was employed to work on this budget-oriented entry-level katana. If this was indeed the case, the polisher at least did a good job with the hamon line. Given how laborious it is to bring it out in a natural way, he deserves some credit. Uh, the Yukoti line is polished in a relatively crisp manner, but I don't see or feel any real geometry to signify the final tapering to the tip. A little bit more noticeable is the Kisagi grinding is asymmetric on the two sides. I would be upset about these flaws if this were a $800 or $2,000 katana, and it doesn't really bother me that much on this $300 piece. All of these aspects I mentioned are purely cosmetic, of course, and none of them affect the usage in any shape or form. But in the world of katanas, they are indeed what people care about, so I guess it's worthwhile to bring them up. Uh, and this sword uh, has a relatively slender blade profile. The profile taper is from uh, 31 millimeters uh, right above the habaki to uh, 22 millimeters right at the Yukote line, this one over here. Uh, and the distal taper is uh, from seven millimeters uh, above the Baki to 4.3 millimeters at the Yukote line. This tapering strategy makes the blade balance really well. Four inches from the Tsuba, um, this kind of balance, I argue is the best compromise between uh, cutting authority and uh, maneuverability. The entire sword weighs two pounds and seven ounces, um, which is um, on the rather lighter side uh, for katanas, uh, even though it's probably average uh, for a blade that is at uh, 27 inches. The blade features a very broad and deep bulky, which means fuller. Uh, some call this the blood groove. Uh, I really resent that uh, categorization. It's not for the blood to run down. Uh, that's not how it works. Is the bohi is there to reduce the weight on the sword blade. It does get the job done. Uh, it's relatively lightweight blade. Given that Japanese swords don't have a pommel, only a cap here, 
you need a very long handle to balance out the blade. The line is very crisp on the bogey. Even though when the bogey on both sides terminate, you can see there is some inconsistency. On this side, uh, it's right before the Yakote line, but on this one here, it's almost above the Yakote line. So there's some inconsistency here. You can see that this bogey here is definitely longer than this one. Um, if you don't pay any attention, you wouldn't notice, of course, and it really wouldn't negatively impact the performance. So with the bulky, um, this deep and broad, almost a third of the blade's width. Um, when you swing it, it has a very loud sword wind. Uh, so it's helpful in uh, dry handling when you practice. And you can see here, the ridge on the mune or the spine is very straight and crisp. The edge geometry on this blade is very good. Uh, clearly designed for light cutting. Um, it's a good V shape uh, with very little nickel or muscle on the blade. So it wouldn't be very durable in hard target cutting, but it will have minimal resistance when you cut light targets. Of course, this blade doesn't have the extra depth between the Shinoji line and the edge as the Hanway Practical Plus XL does. So it doesn't have a bevel as long and the wedge section of the V-shape isn't as narrow or shallow as the Practical SL. You can see it's more obvious here near the tip region. This doesn't mean that the Shikoto Katana is a worse cutter. It just means that it's less forgiving. However, if you compare it to another Katana of regular width, this Tenka Fubu Katana here, you can see, well, they share similar blade profile, relatively uh, the same blade width, even though it's shorter. And the other one happens to be differentially hardened T10 as well. But you can see um, the Hamon line is much less uh, natural than the one on this sword. Uh, so that's definitely a bonus. The edge geometry is good and the sharpness is very adequate. It feels uh, very sharp if you brush your finger against it. Uh, there's no dot spot. Favor slicing time. Uh, Hanway Practical SL. Very smooth, no resistance at all, no tearing. Tenka Fubu Katana. Uh, not as smooth, but still very sharp. Minimal tearing. The ceremonial Hachi made of Tamahagane. Not as sharp. Um, Still adequate. The Shikoto Katana here. Very smooth. Paper slicing proves that uh, it's not exactly as sharp as the um, Hanway Practical XL, but still, it has no problem cutting through bottles uh, made of cardboard uh, or plastic or uh, tree branches. So, it's very good sharpening. Overall, the blade has some minor cosmetic oddities, um, but it doesn't really affect uh, the practical use. Uh, and there's something for you to look at. And you can see here uh, near the habaki, um, the sleeves here, very plain brass. There's no uh, adornment of any kind. And it's a good fit for the Saya, so that's great. The thing that would bother me if I want to nitpick is the Seppa. Uh, here, uh, you probably can see that there is some gap between the sepa and the tuba over here. Um, not so much that you can stick your finger in there, but you can definitely feel it. And it's not fit in a way that's uh, symmetric, which is uh, very problematic. This is made more obvious if you sheath the sword into the saya over here. You can see the gap. And here is not consistent. So for fitting here, it's a little bit um, sloppy. Uh, I would like to see this improved. Uh, as for a practical piece, 
is not that big of an issue. Even though you can say that, well, on the practical SL, it's not an issue. It's a perfect fit. Uh, it's perfectly symmetrical. So it would be nice for them to fix this issue. You can see the Habaki fit here with the blade is relatively tight. There's not much gap on both sides. Here there's more gap than you can see. Now let's move on to the Tsuba. The discards on Asian swords has the dimension to provide this unique canvas for decoration. Together with the Fushikashura, the Tsuba provides a personality for the sword. And you can see here on many pieces, it's richly decorated. The Tenka Fubu Katana is decorated with a samurai helmet with some unique geometries and gold paint on this uh, ceremonial tachi. The tsuba is uh, bronze, it's carved patterns of dragons. It's Conway Practical SL features a sunburst tsuba. Uh, so how does the tsuba on this Shikoto Katana fare? Well, the first thing you notice is how small it is compared to the ones next to it. It's one solid piece of Nagamaru Gata meaning oval-shaped tsuba, made of iron with a bronzed finish. It doesn't have any kogai or kazuka hisunana, you know, those little holes you presumably stick a knife or fork through. Remember on some European sword scabbers, there are little pockets for utensils too. So no add-on for you to eat ramen with, I guess. On the flip side, it feels comfortable and the compact size makes sure it interferes with your technique less supposedly. The casting quality is quite good. The lines and the strokes are very crisp. Even without any bronze or gold paint to provide contrast, you can clearly make out a figure hiding in tall grass, presumably ready to pounce on his prey. The style is incredibly modern. Unlike those stylish carving on antique subas, is that a Naginata the warrior is holding? Anyway, it's not bad looking. It does stick to the overall seam of the sword. The Fuchi and Kashra are uh, made of iron uh, with a bronze finish. They're very plain, completely unadorned in any way, um, but it's consistent with the um, feel of the Tsuba. And it has this uh, riser or ridge here. Um, it's kind of unique. Um, usually they are uh, very rounded to be flush to the Tsuka or the grip. Uh, I really don't like the riser here and it makes the transition very jarring. Here you can feel it stick out. Um, not a major issue during handling. Moving on to the Tsuka, it's a light brown color on um, Ito wrapping over uh, a genuine Same, uh, which is stingray skin. Uh, the ray skin is said to, to be tea colored. Um, it is very different from the uh, usual white gray skin you have on katanas or black ones. Uh, the same seem very rigid um, and it's clearly just two piece um, panels on each side of the wooden core and it's very flat. That's not necessarily an issue but you can make out the termination here, um, this line. Um, it's a little bit unappealing to the eye but when you handle it, you don't actually feel it. And the Tsuka has this um, slightly wasted uh, geometry, so I can appreciate that. It's not completely uh, like an axe handle. Um, and it's relatively uh, narrow on this plane. Um, I suspect it's to uh, fit the blade's uh, slender silhouette. And it's pretty comfortable to hold on to. Um, the thickness is just right. You can see it's secured with two uh, Makuki pegs here. Both Makuki pegs stick out a little bit more than I would like. Uh, you can see here, coming out here, um, on the other side too. Uh, even though when you handle it, it's not very noticeable. Again, over here. And there are two Manukis uh, that would rest on the finger side of the grip um, here. There's no discomfort. Um, the uh, Manuki is brass uh, with some antique finish. The 
e-toe wrap is relatively tight, uh, especially up here. Uh, you really have to apply a lot of force for it to move even half a millimeter. Down here, uh, near the butt or the head in Japanese term, uh, it's a little bit looser, but it's not so much so that you can just move it. And um, the knot is uh, relatively tight, so I wouldn't really worry about this loose it up. Um, how it holds up over time remains to be seen though. And you can see the Kashira is also very plain. Uh, it's kind of a unusual geometry uh, compared to the usual uh, rounded shape on most katanas. Um, it doesn't have this uh, brass piece here to decorate it. Uh, so it kind of, you know, has a cast shape to simulate that. The Fuchi Kashira set has this um, minimalist design that's plain and uh, incognito. Seem to be consistent to this hidden samurai sword's central motive of clandestine operative. Um, you may ask, what about samurai's honor, samurai's code? Uh, well, uh, the code of samurai is a romanticized ideal, a uh, modern concept. In feudal Japan, the code of samurai is to simply serve your leech lord without questioning. As a member of the elite warrior class, to be an instrument for your master to do violence and cause destruction to his rivals. Overall, I would say that the entire katana's uh, aesthetics is very um, consistent. It's very utilitarian oriented. Um, however, there's definitely some features to look at, some cosmetic flaws here and there. Not so much to uh, detract from its uh, overall appeal. Well, the cutting pass is done, and uh, I have demonstrated that this katana can cut well, uh, just as most other katanas. So I asked myself, who is this sword for? And uh, the answer is a little bit tricky because you find both mode of katanas in any bracket, really entry level, uh, mid range, and uh, premium level, and you get antiques on the market. Uh, there's really no shortage of um, this kind of sword. Despite the myriad uh, minor cosmetic flaws, um, it still appears to be uh, properly made. And um, a piece that's fast and agile, um, it's still durable. Uh, you can uh, take it to the dojo or do some practice in the backyard. It's a fine piece for Yaido or Tamishigiri. Sure, it doesn't cut as well as a hallway practical SL, but that sword is considered the cheap coat for cutting practice uh, in the budget range. Uh, this sword, uh, even though uh, it doesn't do much work for you. You still have to take care of the edge alignment, generate enough tip speed. It's very easy to maneuver, and it's a good tool for practice cutting. So cutting enthusiasts and practitioners, give this sword a shot. If you're in for a uh, budget range katana, um, and you don't want to go through uh, the customization process, um, I think this relatively uh, thin looking, minimalist looking, is right for you. Um, go for this one. It's relatively light uh, for average length katana. Um, easy to maneuver, uh, balanced well. Um, so there you go. Yeah, Shikudo, hidden samurai katana.